Hey folks, today I'm going to read you the story of Persephone. It's one of those stories that everybody who knows Greek mythology should know. Um, it's one of the few stories that we're going to, um, I'm going to take the time to teach you that actually involves the god, gods or goddesses. Most of you, um, well, I won't say involves, but the focus is entirely on gods and goddesses. Most of the stories we're going to read are about mortals, and often they have interactions with the gods or goddesses, but rarely is a story strictly about gods and goddesses as this, this one is. Uh, I'm going to read you a version of the story that comes out of this book, Greek Myths, by a um, uh, husband and wife team whose last name is spelled, uh, it's French, De Oliers, D apostrophe A U L I A R E S. It's a good book. Uh, we've had it uh, for our kids, and and we read it to them. Um, it's a good foundation. Um, but like I said, you can write um, kid stories for your projects, and this would be a good example. Uh, I don't love the art in this book, and so I pulled a bunch of images online together uh, to hopefully uh, you know help you visualize what's going on in this story. The first image we've got here is. Uh, that of Hades and Persephone. So the story of Persephone is obviously going to involve the god of the underworld, Hades. Um, and of course, Persephone is the goddess of spring growth. She's a minor goddess. But we're going we're gonna to hear her story. So I'm going to read you this, and uh, I'll scroll down through the pictures and you know, stop and talk about things occasionally. But here we go. Hades, lord of the dead, was a gloomy god of few words. Mortals feared him so much they did not dare to mention his name, for they might attract his attention and he might send for them. Instead of Hades, they called him the Rich One, and indeed rich he was. All the treasures in the ground belonged to him. They also called him the Hospitable One, for in his desolate underground realm, he always had room for another dead soul. All right, let's talk for a second about Hades. Yeah, he's, he's the god of wealth uh, because all of the money buried in the earth is his. Everything underground is his. He's the, the god of the underworld. Um, and this idea of the hospitable one is, is super creepy. Uh, but let's talk about death in, in Greek times um, because that's something you need to know. Um, now, in, in um, more modern religions, especially Judeo-Christian religions, uh, whether it's uh, Christianity uh, or, or not, uh, there's this tendency to believe in um, hell that and heaven, that when you die, you have these two options. You can go up and you can ascend to heaven and, and live an eternal happiness, or you go to hell where you're in eternal torment. Well, in Greek mythology, that wasn't the case. You, everybody who died went to Hades. Um, and inside Hades, there were places like the Elysian Fields where great heroes went and it was happiness all the time. And there were also places uh, like um, I'm trying to, the Pit of Acheron where... Uh, you know, there was there was bad torments for people. So there were sort of heaven and hell places inside Hades, but essentially you became a shade. You became sort of a spectral image of yourself and you went down and you lived, not lived, you died, you undeathed in, in Hades for eternity um, with the Lord of the Underworld. Uh, so that was sort of the, the situation. Anyway, let's get back to our story. Um, Hermes guided the souls of the dead down to the brink of the river Styx, a murky, stagnant river that flowed around the underworld. There, Hermes left them in the charge of the ferryman, Charon. If they had money to pay their fare, Charon sent them across. Now, they usually would bury somebody in ancient Greece with a coin in his mouth, and that coin was to pay the ferryman to get across the river Styx. If you didn't have the coin to pay, it was a long way around um, that you would have to go. Well, let's see. If not, he refused to take them, for he was greedy. Those who could not pay had to wander about till they found the pauper's entrance to Hades. That is why, when a man died, his kin put a coin under his tongue. Oh, yeah, no, the book told us that anyway. Sooner or later, all the mortals came to Hades. Once inside his realm, they whirled about forever like dry leaves in a cold autumn wind. Cerberus, the three-headed dog of the underworld, stood at the gates. He let the dead souls enter, but once past Hades, his gnashing teeth and spiked tail, they could never go out again. Hades lived in a dark and gloomy palace with his ice-cold queen Persephone. She was beautiful, but silent and somber as her husband, for she wasn't happy. She had not come to rule the joyless underworld of her own free will. She had been kidnapped by Hades. So have have some pictures here. Um, I guess I gotta scroll down. Uh, here's an image of Hades that I thought was particularly... Um, impressive slash disturbing. Um, I don't know why he's always depicted depicted with a bident, um, you know, a two-pronged two trident. Uh, but here's Persephone for you. 
uh, goddess of spring flowers. Um, you know, it's nice little spring flowers in her hair. Um, so we got more coming. Let me flip the page of the book and we'll keep reading. Persephone grew up on Olympus and her gay laughter rang through the brilliant hills. Halls, sorry. She was the daughter of Demeter, goddess of the harvest. I've got her coming up next. Whoa. I don't know why. There you go. Demeter, goddess of the harvest. Um, and her mother loved her so dearly, she could not bear to have her out of her sight. When Demeter sat on her golden throne, her daughter was always on her lap. When she went down to earth to look after her trees and fields, she took Persephone. Wherever Persephone danced on her light feet, flowers sprang up. This is her spring sprang up, right? Um, she was so lovely and full of grace that even Hades, who saw so little, noticed her and fell in love with her. He wanted her for his queen, but he knew that her mother would never consent to part with her, so he decided to carry her off. One day, as Persephone ran about in the meadow gathering flowers, she strayed away from her mother and the attending nymphs. Uh, actually, there's, there's a number of different versions of this story, and uh, one of them that I think is particularly interesting is and and this will tie in with the myth of narcissus when we get there one of one of you is going to be teaching that uh persephone is going through this field she sees a flower that she's never seen before uh it's a narcissus flower it's by a it's by a little pool um and she goes over to look at it this flower is a daffodil that's what the narcissus is a, a type of daffodil and she she looks down at it and as she's looking down at this uh flower the ground splits open and out from the ground comes a chariot pulled by black horses and riding the chariot, of course, is Hades. But I'm telling you the story when I should be reading you the story. So uh, let me get back to my story. Um, suddenly the ground split open and from the yawning crevice came a dark chariot drawn by black horses. At the reins stood grim Hades. He seized the terrified girl turned his horses and plunged back into the ground. A herd of pigs rooting in the meadow tumbled into the cleft. And Persephone's cries for help died out as the ground closed again as suddenly as it had opened. Up in the field, a little swineherd stood and wept over the pigs he had lost, while Demeter rushed wildly about in the meadow, looking in vain for her daughter, who had vanished without leaving a trace. So this is particularly disturbing, right? It's a kidnap. Um, you know, she's she's a relatively young girl, and Hades is a much, much older god. And he decides that he likes her, knows that he won't get consent from her mom, so just decides to kidnap her. He rides up, he's like, yoink, takes her and rides back to the underworld um, as a kidnapping. Now, this is, is sort of horrifying. The age gap is horrifying to us nowadays, but um, in ancient Greece, uh, these sorts of marriages were much more common. Um, also, I think it says something about Greek culture and the idea of marriage um, in ancient Greek culture. We're, we're, we're in a di very different culture now, and I think understanding a little bit about um, these people and, and who they were and, and what their situations were like uh, helps you. Uh, you know, this, this kidnapping is, is pretty terrible, um, and, you know, it says something about the power that, that men had that women certainly didn't in that culture. Uh, but marriages a lot of times were, um, especially if you're, if you're uh, a member of high society, were for political benefits. And um, whenever a woman got married, she left her, her father's house, the house she grew up in, where she knew everybody, and she would have to go to the house of the man she married, which might be on a different island or might be very far away. Um, and, you know, being essentially illiterate, uh, you had no contact, you had no way to um, maintain connections with your family. So you essentially severed your old life and began a new life at marriage. And so kidnapping is not entirely an incorrect metaphor for what happens. And, and uh, the situation of Persephone, where she goes from being with her mother and comfort and happiness to being in this cold, foreign land with her husband whom she didn't particularly you know didn't even know before she got married but that was the case a lot of times you know it's it's not culturally that that different from what actually happens to a lot of people and i think that's that's important to think about and know so she was abducted by hades um oh yeah so let's continue our story um so demeter her mom the goddess of the harvest is looking all over the place for her um with 
The frightened girl in his arms, Hades raced his snorting horses down away from the sunlit world. Down and down they sped on the dark path to his dismal underground palace. He led weeping Persephone in, seated her beside him on a throne of black marble, and decked her with gold and precious stones. But the jewels brought her no joy. She wanted no cold stones. She longed for warmth sunshine and flowers and her golden tressed mother dead souls crowded out from the cracks and crevices to look at their new queen while ever more souls came across the sticks and persephone watched them drink from a spring under dark poplars it was a spring of lethe and those who drank from its waters forgot who they were and what they had done on earth radamanthus a judge of the dead dealt out punishment to the souls of great sinners they were sentenced to suffer forever under the whips of the avenging Irenes. Heroes were led to the Elysian fields, where they lived happily forever in never-failing light. Around the palace of Hades, there was a garden where whispering poplars and weeping willows grew. Um, this, of course, is, uh, you know, poplars, when the wind blows through the leaves, you can hear them sort of whisper in the wind. And that's um, that sound. But the weeping willow... Uh, is a tree that we all recognize and, and we have plenty of here. Uh, they grow in Hades uh, because they, they look like they're bowing their heads and, and weeping for the dead. And so it's an appropriate tree to have down in Hades. And the Greeks associated it with, with sorrow and with death. Um, I lost my spot. Um, there was only one tree in the whole realm of Hades that bore fruit. That was a little pomegranate tree. The gardener of the underworld offered the tempting pomegranates to the queen, but Persephone refused to touch the food of the dead. Wordlessly, she walked through the garden as silent, at silent Hades' side, and slowly her heart turned to ice. Oh, that's a metaphor, right? Ice is, is cold, um, and so it's sort of symbolic of her feelings of, her lack of feeling, I guess. She, she became cold and empty living in the world of the dead when she had been a goddess of spring flowers, uh, used to being on the surface and enjoying the sunshine and all of that. Um, but this is a mirroring. Like when you look at the story and the way it's constructed, we have Persephone's heart turning to ice underground. Well, what's going on with the meter? Her mother above ground, her mother lost her daughter, who was the center uh, focus of her life. And and I think the story, too, tells a story about the love of a mother for a daughter, which is an important aspect of, of all human cultures, but Greek culture as well. Above on earth, Demeter ran about searching for her lost daughter, and all nature grieved with her. Flowers wilted, trees lost their leaves, and the fields grew barren and cold. In vain did the plow cut through the icy ground. Nothing could sprout and nothing could grow while the goddess of the harvest wept. People and animals starved, and the gods begged Demeter again to bless the earth. But she refused to let anything grow until she had found her daughter. So up to this point, there had never been a winter. Um, there had never been cold. All the earth was always in summer, always in harvest. Um, but now that Demeter's daughter is gone, she's grieving, and her grief causes the world to turn to winter. Everything freezes over. There's no food. People are dying because they can't grow anything. Um, they're starving to death, and the gods are like, please fix this. And Demeter, Demeter can't think about anything but her lost daughter. Um, bent with grief, Demeter turned into a gray old woman. She returned to the meadow where Persephone had vanished and asked the sun if he had seen what had happened, but he said no. Dark clouds had hidden his face that day. She wandered around the meadow, and after a while she met a youth whose name was Triptolemus. He told her that his brother, a swineherd, had seen his pigs disappear into the ground and had heard the frightened screams of a girl. Demeter now understood that Hades had kidnapped her daughter, and her grief turned to anger. She called to Zeus and said that she would never again make the earth green if he did not command Hades to return Persephone. Zeus could not let the world perish, and he sent Hermes down to Hades, bidding him to let Persephone go. Even Hades had to obey the orders of Zeus, and sadly he said farewell to his queen. Joyfully, Persephone leaped to her feet, and as she was leaving with Hermes, a hooting laugh came from the garden. There stood the skull-faced gardener of her, sorry, gardener of Hades, grinning. He pointed to a pomegranate from which a few of the seeds were missing. Persephone, lost in thought, had eaten the seeds, he said. 
Then Dark Hades smiled. He watched Hermes lead Persephone up to the bright world above. He knew that she must return to him, for she had tasted the food of the dead. There's echoes of the Adam and Eve story and the forbidden fruit here, I think. Um, something something that, that connects those two cultures and those two stories. Uh, both cultures are from the same geographic region. You know, it, it would make sense that there's a little bit of a, a connection there. Um, when Persephone again appeared on Earth, Demeter sprang to her feet with a cry of joy and rushed to greet her daughter. No longer was she a sad old woman, but a radiant goddess. Again, she blessed her fields and the flowers bloomed anew and the grain ripened. Dear child, she said, never again shall we be parted. Together we shall make all nature bloom. But joy soon was changed to sadness, for Persephone had to admit that she had tasted the food of the dead and must return to Hades. However, Zeus decided that mother and daughter should not be parted forever. He ruled that Persephone had to return to Hades and spend one month in the underworld for each seed she had eaten. Oops, went too far. Hey, it's Hades and Persephone. Uh, there's Persephone and her pomegranate. Uh, how many did she eat? Um, it does not say. Uh, every year when Persephone left her, Demeter grieved. Nothing grew, and there was winter on earth. But as soon as her daughter's light footsteps were heard, the whole earth burst into bloom. Spring had come. As long as mother and daughter were together, the earth was warm and bore fruit. Demeter was a kind goddess. She did not want mankind to starve during the cold months of the winter when Persephone was away. She lent her chariot laden with grain to Triptolemus, the youth who had helped her find her lost daughter. She told him to scatter her golden grain over the world and teach men how to sow it in the spring and reap it in the fall and store it away for the long months when again the earth was barren and cold. And that's the story of Persephone and Hades, the story of Persephone in the underworld. Um, yeah, that's not Persephone from the cartoon, but whatever. This is a pretty good image that shows sort of the relationship the two of them have with each other. Persephone's married to Hades. She doesn't particularly like him. She doesn't like being in the underworld. Uh, she ate six pomegranate seeds, so she has to stay in the underworld for six months out of the year. And this explains the changing of the seasons. Uh, you know, when, when she is drawn back into the underworld, summer starts turning to fall and all the leaves slowly fall off the trees. And then you have winter. And when she comes back... Um, Things start shooting up out of the ground, and we have spring. Um, she doesn't love it down there in, in Hades. So whenever you see a myth with Persephone and Hades in the underworld, um, she's usually uh, sort of cold and emotionless uh, to him because she's not uh, in love with him. But she accepts her marriage with him. She ex accepts the sort of contract that they have together. Um, so what kind of myth is this, I guess, is the question that we've got to answer um, this is a myth that describes why things are the way they are. Why do we have seasons? You know, this is a question that people would have asked. And they didn't understand the tilt of the earth and uh, the rotation around the sun and all those things that actually give us seasons. No. Uh, in, if you're uh, from an old culture, an old agricultural culture, you need to know why there are seasons. And you want, you want some sort of an answer to that. And stories provide the answer. There's sort of two ways to look at the world. Uh, there's, a, there's a way in which you can answer your queries with stories which are sort of metaphorical and hold truths and explain um, the world. And that's how old cultures used to do it. Now we have science, we have math and a mathematical understanding of the world. You ask a question, you find answers that are testable through theories and, um, you know, all those sorts of things. And so a mathematical answer to the question, why do we have seasons, has to do with the, the tilt of the earth on its axis, the rotation around the sun, um, you know, and uh, the way the sun hits hits the planet and the hemispheres and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the Greeks didn't know that. So their answer was, well, there's this girl of, of um, spring. Her name is Persephone and her mom is Demeter. And this is the story about how winter happens and why winter happens. And it's a story about grief and uh, a mother's relationship with a daughter and you know, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, there are three common types of myths that we're going to see. This is the first one I've taught you, uh, but you're going to see the other two types of myths as I teach you other ones. Uh, the, the first and most common type of myth is uh, a myth that explains why things are the way they are. Why do we have spiders? Uh, why do we have seasons? Why is the sky blue? Uh, why is there a Sahara desert? Um, all of those kinds of things. So, um, you know, all of those are, are good options. Um, 
options. So all of those are, are there are myths that tell those stories. Uh, another very common type of myth is the impossible journey myth. Uh, you know, go kill Medusa or um, go retrieve this golden fleece or uh, do these 12 labors, you know, like whatever it happens to be, there are lots of heroes that are similar on impossible journey. The point of the impossible journey is to kill the hero off and have them not, not ever return. But of course, uh, with the help of the gods, with divine intervention, these heroes are able to go off and, and achieve, uh, impossible journeys and the myths about those that do achieve the impossible journey, um, have come down through the ages to us. So that's another type of myth that you frequently run into. And the third one is, myths that either reinforce social rules or expose taboos, things that people should never do. You know, let's have a myth about why we don't commit incest or have a myth about why we don't have cannibalism. Uh, or we'll, we'll have a myth that teaches the importance of hospitality um, and treating people with with kindness. Uh, so there, there are these three major types of myths that you can peg almost all myths into. Some do multiple things. A lot of myths have reinforcing social rules in them. Um, don't kidnap your bride, people. It always creates problems, right? So like that's sort of hinted at in here. Uh, there's also some symbols, some I, I think important symbols that come across in this one. Um, the the one thing that you need to know for poetry moving forward that you're going to see in, in poetry and in literature is that the seasons often represent the human life cycle. Uh, so there are four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And uh, spring represents birth a lot of times. Um, it, new growth starts coming. Um, summer is sort of maturity. Then, then fall is age when you start to get past your prime and, you know, the leaves fall off the tree metaphorically. And um, then winter is death. And winter being death really, really connects with this particular myth. And I it, sometimes wonder if this is this this metaphor of the seasons and the life cycle is not connected specifically with Persephone because when Persephone disappears into the ground, winter comes and that winter is, is a time of grief. She goes down to the underworld with Hades. And so on some level, the world dies every year in the winter and is reborn every year in spring. And that has to do with this myth in particular. So that idea of the, the cycle uh, being symbolic, I think is important in, in the story as well. Uh, like I said, there's also that sort of hint about a forbidden fruit, um, which comes in. Um, and then things we learn about Greek society. We talked a little bit about marriage and, and the marriage situation. I think this is a myth that helps you understand uh, some Greek ideals about marriage uh, and how it can often feel like an exile to the person who is uh, the woman, especially who's forced out of her out of her homeland, away from her family to go someplace new and start a new life. Uh, where maybe she didn't want to. Her father wanted to form an alliance with so-and-so and then married her off to so-and-so's son and they don't know each other. And, you know, that's, I think that gives you a, a hint about um, Greek culture. So anyway, I think that's that's probably enough to go on uh, for the myth of Persephone. Um, it tells us why we have seasons. I think... Oh, right. Before I sign off, we also we're going to run into this this pair of uh, Persephone's Persephone and Hades a few times in our other myths. Orpheus has to make a trip to the underworld uh, where you're going to see the two of them. And that's that's kind of a big deal. Uh, we also have uh, Hercules make a trip to the underworld and Odysseus in the Odyssey is going to make a trip to the underworld. So they're they're important characters uh, moving forward. Uh, and, and she also shows up very prominently in some Percy Jackson books, if you ever read those.